and we are live. Hooray, here we go. So hi everyone. Thank you for being here today. I am Carrie Friedberg, the SF Money Coach. I am a holistic money coach, financial behavior specialist, and financial literacy educator. I recently launched a do-it-yourself personal finance 101 course with 25 mini lessons on the practical and emotional sides of money, which comes with a membership site where you can learn, practice, connect, and receive support around money for an entire year. You can read all of the details at sfmoneycoach.com slash membership. Today, my dear friend, Chaplain Amanda Coggin is here joining us. Amanda and I met at working at a progressive independent school together in the Mission District of San Francisco back in the early 2000s. We've had an epic friendship and now our seven-year-old daughters are best friends too. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for being here. Hey, Carrie. I'm so happy to be here to do this today. Yay! Amanda began her path into death and dying work while living in Southeast Asia in year 2000, where she began a Buddhist practice and um, started enjoying Vipassana meditation. She later discovered grief and hospice work through the transformational loss of her boyfriend to suicide in 2007. After participating in a mindfulness grief group and suicide support group, Amanda began volunteering with Zen Hospice Project as a bedside bedside caregiver in order to expand her Buddhist understanding and relationship to our shared mortality. She came on staff at Zen Hospice Project's volunteer coordinator in 2013. Amanda went on to complete a chaplain training program at UCSF, where she works today in adult and pediatric chaplaincy. Her passions in work and chaplaincy are treating intergenerational trauma in family systems, practicing trauma responsive care, advocating for early palliative care in patient cases where there is extreme suffering, and the spiritual openings in end of life care. Amanda is the trustee and power of attorney for her elderly mother and joyfully raises her seven-year-old daughter with her husband in Berkeley. She's joined me today to talk about aging and money. <laughs> so Amanda, let's start. Would you share with us a little bit about your background and family history with money? Sure. Uh, it's a rich topic. It's very clear to me what our relationship to money is has been and continues to be. Um, so my earliest memory is that people either had money or didn't have money. And the people who didn't have money were always trying to get money from the people who had it. Uh -huh. And so there was no, um, like I never really saw anyone like take ownership around money for themselves or have a relationship to money or know how to work with money or know how to balance their checkbook. Um, and so I had this interesting childhood where I lived with a single mom who was working, you know, newly divorced in the seventies when divorce was becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. And so I had a working mom who worked really hard, but probably really under earned because I remember her going to my oldest sister at the time who was you know, only in her early teens um, and asking her for money to kind of cover the bills. Yeah. Um, and then I would go to my dad and stepmother's house for the weekends and they belonged to a country club and we would sign a four digit code to get our needs met <laughs> and get fed. So nobody was really, I felt like nobody was in reality about what money did or how you got it or how you managed it. Wow. Yeah. And, and those, those extremes and you would go like house to house or on, on your custody schedule, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we were really poor at mom's house and it felt really rich at dad's house. I see. And um, how do you think these early memories have impacted your relationship with money today? Well, um, I, it's not that different, actually. <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely more in conversation around money in my family and with my husband. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've had to do a lot of learning, but there's still so much for me to learn. Like, I feel like every time we 
decide to make a big purchase or when it comes to like buying a house or Mm -hmm. um, anything like that. Like I, it's like, I have to go back to school and I have to learn and I have to understand. And um, I'm a little bit more out of touch with the day in and day out budgeting. That's more of like the division of labor of my husband and me is like, I manage all the life, life skills, emotional skills, the calendar, the house, yeah, um, my own work, raising my daughter. Um, and then my husband does more of the financial stuff. So I, it's still a little bit out of reach for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but we are in conversation about it. We're in reality around it. Yes. We are working with a financial planner. Mm -hmm. Um, we were able to, you know, put in our goals for what we want to do when we want to retire, what it might look like. So yeah, like I'm just more in the game. Yeah, you totally are. Um, and I agree with you that learning about money is a lifelong process for me as well. I'm constantly learning, about um, how to be an adult, a responsible adult with money. And um, it seems like there are ever growing areas to return to school, to read, to ask questions, to possibly hire financial support team members for help in certain areas, you know, to make decisions um, with professional guidance. So I hear you, we're in the same boat. Yeah. Um, got it, okay. And so, then people may be wondering what, how money and end of life or aging, why do I have a chaplain on my you know, podcast or expert interview series? Well, I wanted to talk with you, first of all, because it, this is fun for us. <laughs> um, and I love to work together. And, and Amanda and I have lots of ideas about you know, meaningful workshops and uh, retreats that we could host and, and guide for people um, for a future date. But anyway, I, I think that money is related to our everyday life experience, whether, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we like it or not, it's something we, we must face and embrace for the rest of our lives. And then beyond the end of our life, there may be money left over or a legacy or, and so it's really a big topic and, and quite deep. So let's take a step back. And would you tell us about how you became a chaplain and, and your thoughts about how aging and money are connected? Yeah, I'll answer that twofold. So the way I became a chaplain was it, it, it sometimes feels like it was an accident. And then when I actually like reflect spiritually, which is what I do in my life and in my work, it, it's like all this, all the things were there to put me in this trajectory. So I remember um, when I lived in Southeast Asia, just being blown away with how much death was integrated into life. Right. So it was the burning guts in India and how the family carries the body and the eldest son cracks the skull to let the spirits out yeah. um, before they cremate. It was the cremation months in Bali that I stumbled upon um, where they exhume the body, they take it, they've been mummified, they take it, they put it into um, like, a, like a temple spirit, well, spirit houses are in Thailand, but it's sort of this built structure that they carry, the village carries together and they move it around to keep it away from the dark spirits. And, and then they light it on fire. And I remember the ashes of the body and the structure falling on me like snow. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, the spirit houses in Thailand for the people who have lost, which is sort of similar to like what we do um, or what we observe in Dia de los Muertos in Mexico. And um, and has now been integrated here in California for sure. Yeah. So that was always really intriguing to me. I was like, wait a second. It, it's right. sort of like this thing about money. It's like, wait a second, you can talk about this stuff mm -hmm. and you can have a relationship to this. That's interesting. So my curious was perked when I was just backpacking by myself through Asia. Mm -hmm. And I was just on this quest, I think at that stage, I was 25 to just see like how else do you do life? How else does life work in the world? Yeah. Um, so that whole almost two years that I spent over there was just an education and schooling me on life. Mm -hmm. And so death was just always around. Um, and then I 
started my Buddhist practice there, Vipassana, which is one type of Buddhist practice, mm -hmm. scanning the body for sensations. You sit 10 day silent retreats. I'm sure many people have heard of this. Um, and I did my first one in Bali and I was hooked. I was like, wow, like I don't need to imbibe in drugs and alcohol anymore. Not that there was a problem, but I was definitely like the party girl in San Francisco. Right. And I was like, oh, this is sort of like a feeling, a calmness, mm -hmm. um, a, like settling into my body, my mind and my spirit that I had been searching for probably my whole life. And in those 10 day courses, death is talked about constantly in the sense that you know, as we're practicing meditation long term, the goal is to be able to be with that final breath that arises. Yeah. And, passes, and that final breath being your death. And so, as much as meditation is learning how to calm the mind, uh, maybe get over an addiction, or maybe learn how to be kinder to your husband or your kids. Yeah. Um, for me, the theme throughout those that course was I'm preparing for death. Mm -hmm. And nobody had ever prepared me for that. No adult ever talked about death. Um, even in my Episcopalian um, church experience, it just there wasn't any conversation around death. So I felt like it was the first time in Buddhist practice that I was like, oh, we're talking about death. And this right. is how you die. This is yeah. how you prepare to die. Okay. So that was very intriguing. And then... Um, I carried on with that uh, as I came back to San Francisco after being in Asia mm -hmm. and met you, worked at a school, continued to meditate and just practiced every day, every day, went to 10 day retreats every year. I was very committed. Yes, you have been. I, I have to say that um, the one 10 day silent retreat I did was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. That is, I mean, my palms are sweating thinking about it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's no joke. It is no joke. It, it, you, it, you know, what you learn to do is you learn to sit with pain. Right. I think so much of the human experience is about joy, but so much of it is about pain. Yes. And having an aversion to pain and pushing it away, throwing it onto others, so be it. And Vipassana was the first place I learned how to sit with my pain. Mm -hmm. And I still, when I'm not practicing, I still throw my pain onto others. I still want to avoid it. Yes. But I have tools now to return to the breath, return to the sensations on my body and just sort of ride it out. Um, so that was great preparation for meeting somebody who was in a lot of pain mm -hmm. and that ended up being, um, my boyfriend who took his life. He was so much more than that. Yeah. He was an incredible man and really brilliant, very creative. He was a woodworker. He was a timber framer. He was just a brilliant, brilliant man. Yeah. Um, and we had a beautiful love story that was very tumultuous as love stories can be. And, um, you know, I had to do a lot of soul searching as to why I came to choose somebody like that in my life. Um, and that's a whole nother podcast, but what, um, what came to pass is he ended up taking his own life in 2007. Mm -hmm. Uh, it totally was the life event that brought me to my knees literally. And, um, thank God for my, um, Vipassana practice. The first thing I did after I heard about his suicide is I sat down and I meditated Wow. Because I knew that was where to start from. And, and that led me on this grief journey, which is sort of like my Twitter handle, the blog I wrote years ago called gift of grief. Yeah. Uh, because my experience of grief was that it was tremendously heart opening mm -hmm. and um, taught me compassion and taught me how to be with others in their pain in a way that I had never been able to be with before. And so I just sought out the people who could sit in that muck with me. And that led me to the mindfulness grief group at Zen Hospice Project. That led me to the suicide support group at the San Francisco Suicide Prevention, which is an incredible organization. I went on to learn how to lead suicide support groups, though chose not to do it yeah. um, ultimately. And then that just, I just kept going like that. And I, then I was like, oh, I want to write about this because I was writing about it anyway. Yes. And that's what got me um, volunteering at the bedside at Zen Hospice Project. Mm -hmm. And that work was sort of like, almost like all that, the suicide and all of that, like led me to that work because I had had that inkling about death in Asia, right? And then right. I ended up by way of the suicide, I ended up at this Buddhist organization with people who had a meditation practice 
and we're bringing it to be of service to those who are dying. Wow. Okay. And I was like, these are my people. <laughs> and they were all ages and they were from all um, ethnicities and um, everyone had a Buddhist practice mm -hmm. and everyone wanted to develop a relationship to their own dying. And by, by doing that, by sitting with people who are dying, you are constantly seeing yourself reflected in them. Right. And um, you're learning how to separate yourself from becoming that, be, be, uh, separate yourself from, you know, the transference, counter-transference, projecting your stuff onto them, right. their stuff projecting on you. It's, it's really a fascinating human experience. Trying to fix it or take their pain away. Oh, all, right, all that stuff that I was, that I was doing um, most of my life and had, had been taught that to do that. So you really, it was just a, it's just a brilliant, brilliant combination and everyone gets served. Really, wow. everyone is served in that um, reciprocal process. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of what got me going. I was volunteering and I, I you know, I came to it as book research. I, I thought I would write about it and I may still do that someday. Yeah. But I ended up falling in love with the work and I found my community and I worked there on staff with some incredible um, thought leaders, BJ Miller, um, Roy Reamer, our current executive director, and just an incredible group of volunteers um, for years who are still in my life. Yeah. Um, and I worked at the hospice house, the guest house in San Francisco across from the Zen Center, which was started by the Zen Center during the AIDS epidemic. And I also uh, volunteered at Laguna Honda, which is sort of the last remaining almshouse where people of, of low means can go to live out the rest of their lives. It's a long-term care facility. It's an incredible place. So I got to serve at both places, came on staff, and then I had my daughter and that was an amazing experience. And then I was like, I need more. So I went and did uh, clinical pastoral education training at UCSF, one of the best CPE programs in the country mm -hmm. and one of the best palliative care departments, largest, oldest palliative care department in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to train with all those people. And that's where I continue to work as an on-call chaplain today. And in fact, going in right after our call. So. Amazing. Oh my gosh. And I, um, we've been friends throughout this entire journey. I remember, I remember so many, um, so many experiences and connections along the way, but I love hearing all the, the details and, and the story. So how do you think aging and money is connected? Why did you say yes to coming today? <laughs> well, because I'm in the thick of it really, um, caregiving my mom. And I think that's probably a lot of what I'll share about, um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I see it, I see it in different ways in the hospital, which I also want to touch upon. Um, but I'll share, I'll kind of share from both places. I'll share first from my personal experience, and then I'll also share what I've seen in the hospital. Okay. So um, my current experience is I am the trustee of um, a special needs trust that my mother has, which was set up to care for her in her elder years by her family. Mm -hmm. And my mom has, you know, had been sort of supported by that trust for most of her life in some way or form. I wasn't so involved in that because I was younger and somebody else was trustee. Right. Um, but I think my relationship to, I'm oh, sorry, my mother's relationship to money, my family's relationship to money has made sort of that trustee guardian relationship with her like super tumultuous. So I think there's been just a handful of trustees over the years who've like left, like thrown their hands into the air and been like, right, right. I'm done. Oh boy. Um, yeah. And so um, I sort of became next in line and, you know, I won't dive into the details as to why, but I just sort of was like, it feels like I'm the next right person to do this. Right. Um, and I wanted to learn. And really what I wanted to do is I wanted to protect that one asset that my mother had. Right. I wanted to protect it, protect, protect it from herself. Yes. Protect it from others. Um, yes. To, um, to help it last for her entire life. However long that, right. that was your main goal. Yeah. Right. So I think, I think one thing I notice in this culture is I think people don't really realize how expensive it is to grow old in this country. Mm -hmm. because unlike other countries, like for example, my husband's German in Germany, like people still have pensions. And I mean, we do too in this country, but that's mm -hmm. sort of, it kind of went away with the, um, the IRA and 401k. Thank God, yes. but also madness. Yes. <laughs> that is. 
um, another podcast. Um, so uh, it's expensive. It, it's expensive if you want to do it well. Mm -hmm. it, there is also the Medicaid and the support structure if you are poor. So, you know, thank God we have that. The care there is hit or miss. I'm, we're experiencing that currently with my mom. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, <clears throat> basically my experience is that you have this set money and you either have it in assets or you either have it in a trust or you have it in a 401k <clears throat> or an IRA. Um, and you need to turn that money into cash in order to pay caregivers. Um, right. And that's sort of the place that we're in right now. So um, my mom does qualify for Medicaid because her social security is so low. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we have been having her live in assisted living facilities. Um, so she did assisted living facilities where she played a, paid a private rate, which was um, in her case, like $5,000 a month for a studio, a very, very small room. Yes. I know if you get into the, uh, memory care, that can go anywhere up to $15,000 a month, maybe even more. Mm -hmm. um, some of these places you have to, my other parents have bought into a place where you, it's like you buy a home, right. you're buying an apartment. And then if you're fortunate, these places are rare. Um, when you die, that money gets returned back to the family's estate. Mm -hmm. uh, because they can just resell it to the next family coming down the pipeline. Um, but those places are really um, becoming less and less um, available. Right. They're more like for, for profit. I mean, yeah, they're for profit and, and they, that money will not get re returned to your estate. So you might right. be paying 600 to 900,000 to buy in and, and that's it. And then you're also paying on top of that, you know, five, six, thousand dollars a month just to live there which is like your meals and the facility fees and right the nursing fees if yes you're, you're you know like my parents are paying into a system that when they get to the point where they need to step up to the next level of care mm -hmm. they will have paid into that system hopefully but you got to read the fine print you got to know if there's going to be extra costs if it's memory care so it's expensive yes. to, do, to do well to and die. To die. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and so to much age. dying is the caregiving beforehand. Right. Right. I guess I meant to say to age. Yes. Yeah. To age. Um, and then, you know, if you don't go into a facility and you're living with an adult child, if you have that ability, right. a lot of people have to do that at a necessity because they don't have the means to pay that $5,000 a month private pay. And that's where your mom has landed now, right? Yeah. With your sister. Yeah. So then you have to figure out, okay, so um, who, how does that, how does my sister get reimbursed for having my mother increase her expenses? Right. And that's what we're currently navigating. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and the way we, and, and we still have to sort of work it out or it's sort of a work in progress, but the way we've settled on now is, um, you know, I'm basically paying my sister rent. Yes. My mom to live there, just like my mom would have paid rent at her facility. Mm -hmm. Got um, it. And it's not a perfect science. We're like I said, we're trying to figure it out as we go. Yes. Um, but I've done a lot of like, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. Uh, you know, I had a difficult conversation with my sister around money recently. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm going to need to get back to you on this. And I reached out to a fiduciary because I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. because <laughs> I don't want to get into the muck that is my family and money the dynamics, the family yeah. history around money, other people's needs, like trying to focus on the patient in this case, being your mom. Um, yeah. yeah. I can so, see how complicated it can get. Oh, for sure. And, and other people's relationship to money versus your relationship to money. And I'm right. the one who's in charge of the money and people don't like that, but somebody has to be in charge of it. Yes. Mom can't be anymore. So it's just like all, basically all those family dynamics that are in your family that you're often trying to avoid right. show up, not just at the wedding, which we see, but, at, but in end of life. And so they're there. Right. And so you have to, you have to deal with them or not. And um, end of life can be, let's call it like a 30 year process. If, I mean, if, if there were other um, physical conditions, health conditions that expanded that even longer, like if people are disabled in some way, um, my mom's 
death diagnosed cancer diagnosis and then she died it was pretty quick she died you know within 11 months so i didn't have to um navigate as much as as you have because your mom is in and out of the hospital or you know continuing um to to live and and thrive thankfully um but it's been a longer more exasperated financial journey because um of her health ups and downs yeah my mom has nine lives so she's one of those people where like she's either gonna die tomorrow or she's gonna go another 30 years like i'm sort of prepared for both yeah. Um, it's just like, it's the ride I'm on. And, yeah. um, you know, yesterday was my birthday and I spent the whole day on the phone with my siblings, you know, trying to, you know, advocate for mom being a candidate for hospice. And yet I'm reading an article in the New York times that hospice is overwhelmed. They are having to put people on wait lists. We are oh, wow. in a caregiving crisis in this country. And so, mm -hmm. and also, um, hospice, is is really an insurance benefit in this country which is that's a whole nother podcast that's a problem um, people get onto hospice and if they don't die within six months they get taken off hospice so that's another roller coaster ride so um you know you're trying to piece it together financially now a lot is paid covered by medicare mm -hmm. you know my mom has supplemental health insurance which i highly recommend hanging on to for your parents um, so basically like a Blue Cross Blue Shield supplemental, whatever your private insurance plan is. My mom has that. And then she also has Medicare. So right. Medicare pays for some prescriptions um, stuff. It pays for the hospital stays. It doesn't pay for um, the ambulance that takes her to the rehabs if she goes to a skilled nursing facility after a hospital stay. So if you imagine like somebody's living for 30 years doing right. this, we, this is what happens. It becomes this merry-go-round. Merry they live in a facility, they live in your home, they have a fall, they go into the emergency room, mm -hmm. they go and have a hospital stay, stay, they take a hit, they decline, but everyone wants them not to die because that's how the hospital system is built and that's how doctors and nurses are educated. Yeah. And so they get spit out into a skilled nursing facility for rehab, they, they take a hit, they've declined, they go home, they fall again, they right. and it just go round and round. And you know, my mom in seven years has lived in six facilities. Mm -hmm. um, she has mental health issues and, and, and lots of other issues. So she's a se severely complicated case. We've um, done outpatient palliative care for bits of time. Um, but she's been on this merry-go-round and my sister, her caregiver is like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And finally, we're in a hospital, finally, where there's a palliative care team mm -hmm. and a cardiologist. I find that doctor right. who will validate your experience and say to you, like this cardiologist said to my sister the other day, and I had met him on a previous hospital stay. Mm -hmm. He's a straight shooter. And he was, and she said, I don't want to do this to me anymore. And he said, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. You are the healthcare power of attorney and you also get to decide. Right. And so that sort of leads to the next piece, which is having all your paperwork in order. And you can ask me about that if you want. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's a whole nother podcast, but right. um, having advanced care directive paperwork is so important. In fact, I, I didn't realize how important it would be until I experienced my birthday yesterday where I was literally like like taking screenshots of the wording in my mom's healthcare directives to prove to one of my family members that my mom does not want high intervention. Uh -huh. While she may not qualify for hospice when we have our hospice meeting tomorrow, I hope she does because getting people on hospice early only benefits everyone. Right. It's done well and people actually rebound and do better and often the, the research shows they live longer on hospice so hospice is not this like oh my god stop they're gonna die tomorrow it, yeah. it, it doesn't work that way right unless you're really really ill yeah and often people get on hospice too late and, and then it happens so soon but mm -hmm. basically the the, the the final answer to your question is like money and death are so intertwined you're looking at both of them all the time i mean you need to be on your game Right. You really, really do. Wow. 
and for the merry-go-round you described and over the many years and all of these moves in and out of facilities, there are financial implications and insurance and claims to file and cash to pay out and, 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 and for every well, single move every day. Yeah. And I will also say, which could also be a whole other podcast that I sort of became an armchair expert without really wanting to about was, was how to get on Medicaid. And so the Medicaid application process is no joke. Um, right. There are all these rules. You can have certain assets, but other assets you can't, you, you know, I be careful of the facility that tells you, you have to spend down everything. Right. So a spend down um, briefly is you have a chunk of money. They know you have that money. They, you know, the way Medicaid works is you need to spend down your assets until you get to like under $2,000. And then they will allow you to live in the facility at the Medicaid rate. Um, and so I was sort of in the process of spending down my mother's special needs trust until I realized like, oh my God, that's a protected asset. So I, I needed to get an elder law attorney to help me protect that asset because really it's, it's my mom's social security income that the facility should have been taking, not from her special needs trust because that is a protected asset. So like I, see. I had to learn all the ins and outs of the Medicaid approval process and not to let facilities sort of strong arm me into what their policies are mm -hmm. when the law is different. So I, a big shout out to elder law attorneys for this yes. support, but also my elder law attorney cost $15,000 to re, you know, to decant one trust. And because my mom was going to be inherit and still is, would be inheriting some funds from an uncle who died many years ago, the aunt just died. Now, the, you know, now the money's coming, but I don't want it to go to the facility. I want it to go to our special needs trust. So like you can hear in my breathing, right? <laughs> it's a lot. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's easily a full-time job. I make it a part-time job um, by setting boundaries and having self-care and, and tackling it when I can. Right. And, you know, raising my hand for help when I need to find those people to help me. That sounds very healthy. I, I'm so curious, has money ever come up on someone's deathbed? Mm -hmm. um, regrets or hopes or last minute wishes? You know, this, I'm glad you're bringing this up because it brought me, brings me back to this other um, piece I wanted to speak about, which is in the hospital. So I, I just want to, I'll put a finger there and we want to come, I want to come back to that. But of all the people I've sat with in their dying, um, I haven't actually had that experience where like there's one family member on one side of the bed fighting with the other family on the other side of the bed about the money. Right. Um, it probably happens more behind closed doors. So that's not to say it doesn't happen. It's just that I, as a chaplain, have not um, witnessed that so much. Mm -hmm. What I have experienced is um, mostly when I was sitting with the dying at the, the Zen Hospice guest house. Yeah. In Luna Honda, we're dealing with people who were living on the streets. And by the grace of God, thing, and I'm not, I'm not actually not Christian chaplain, but I use that terminology a lot because I, I think. I think there is a higher power and there is some God protection in these final moments of our lives. But by the grace of God, these people end up at Laguna Honda. They have no means. They've lived living on the streets and they get to live out their lives here. It's a, it, there's a beautiful book about it called God's Hotel, which is also about um, slow medicine and the end of life experience. A really beautiful book I recommend. Um, okay. But anyway, um, for those folks, money's not an issue because money, they've never really dealt with money their whole life. Um, probably because they never had a relationship with money or it was dysfunctional or they just, you know, they ended up on the streets for because of trauma reasons and all sorts of stuff. So money is not coming up so much there. Right. But when I'm sitting with the dying with people who have money, it's more like they're talking about their things. So yeah. people are really attached to their stuff until they're not right so when a person's um you know i remember we had this beautiful resident um at the guest house um and and she would talk to us about you know i need to go back and there's all my things in my apartment and i need to like they're more worried about tending to their things i see um and and then there comes a point in the dying process where the 
the patient, the resident, the person in the bed is no longer attached to those things. And so it just stops coming up. Okay. So don't talk about it anymore. At the end of life, it's really all about the relationships. Mm -hmm. which is why I love this work because I love relationships. I love the um, complicated stuff. I love the beauty in relationships. I love the pain in relationships. Mm -hmm. I find it all fascinating. Um, and that's so much of what my work is about is like helping people navigate their relationships while they're in this sort of caregiving or dying crisis. Oh my um, gosh. So, so yeah, it's about their relationships to people. Mm -hmm. And then for a bit, it's their relationships to their things. And that might include the money, but then that all that begins to die off before the actual body and person dies. You're reminding me of um, when my mom was intubated, dying of brain cancer. And um, so she couldn't speak anymore. And she was scribbling as well as she could write with her one good arm, um, a Christmas list. And she wanted to buy, like she had this idea of black cashmere sweaters for me and my sister and my cousin and this other cousin. And, you know, it was one of my mom's primary love languages was gifting. And she was very much about, about the things and had the Christmas room and it was nearing Christmas time when, when she wrote that list. And so, um, anyway, that, <laughs> yeah, I, that, oh, I, that's so common. I think there's this phrase, the way you live is the way you die. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had a similar experience yesterday. My mom, as we're trying to figure out how we can get her on hospice so that she can get more support and, and get off this merry-go-round, um, she hadn't been talking or eating for three days in the hospital, which was sort of making us believe that like this hospice transition is, is imminent. Right. Um, and then yesterday, um, I saw a phone call come in with an 847 area code, which is the Chicago area where I grew up. And I usually, I didn't answer it, but I thought, hmm, I should answer that just in case. And I called back and a person on the line said, there's somebody who wants to talk to you. And I was like, I didn't know who this person, I didn't know this voice, I didn't recognize it. And I was like, okay. And it was my mother for the first time in like three days who hasn't spoken a word and hasn't eaten or has refused to eat. And she said, I wanted to make sure to wish you a happy birthday. I didn't want to miss it. Aww. It was like five at night. It was the end of the day. I had yeah. spent the whole day like texting with my sister. It was a rough day yesterday. It was right, rough. right. And she said, and then she said, um, I said, uh, wow, like, hi, mom. <laughs> you know, I was just like, but this is sort of the, the end of life experience. Like there are these little first yes. rebounding. Um, it's still a, a downward trajectory. We, we know this palliative care has a graph that shows this with um, long-term aging, not so much with the fast disease, the cancers, like right. like that, but this is the, the, the slow trajectory down, downward. And then she said, I want to make sure that you sent Amanda a birthday check. <laughs> Did you do that? And that was what my mom always did. And I'm in charge of the birthday checks. And, I and I said, you know, mom, I'm so, it's so sweet that you remembered. And Amanda doesn't need anything. She, she just wanted this call. So that's what you said? Like she didn't, yeah. I'm oh sort God. of like, I sort of was meeting her in her slight memory loss place. Yes, yes. Which was like, she knew she had, she had had this instinct to call me. I mean, I was like, how does she even know my phone number? I know there's so many things, but yeah, yeah, like none of that mattered. What right. mattered was that that was that's my mom's relationship to money. Uh -huh. You sort of like somebody else writes the check <laughs> and you gift it and you have it, but but knowing the details around that is not so much my mom's strong suit. And it was very sweet um, because you know I of course she doesn't. We don't do that anymore because my mom doesn't have the money to do uh -huh. that. Um, or maybe I'll send 25 bucks to the grandkid, you know, right. Um, she has that, but, um, but we're really trying to, we're, we're really like bending down the hatches with her funds because there's not much left. Um, but I was able to, I, I think the point in that story was that like, yes, that's her relationship to money. And I could just meet her in, in her like creative mind in, in the, the mind that's losing its mind. Yes. If you meet it in the creative space, 
and in the storytelling and in the nonsense that doesn't seem based in reality, if you can meet people in that space, you will be calmer and they will be calmer. And so that's what I did. I said, Amanda is fine. And she just wanted this call, you know, and then I came back to being Amanda. Right. right. <laughs> and then you're like, yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yes. I mean, it is like improv in a way. Um, yeah. Like it's like, you, yeah. It's using your best preschool teacher, early childhood mom vibe. Yes. Yes. So can you describe what you think aging gracefully means? Mm. My husband and I were just talking about this, actually. Um, yes, I have very strong opinions on this because I, 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 I've seen it done so many ways because I sat with people aging um, who are dying. I have three parents who are aging and elders. And then I had all these amazing volunteers that I was um, volunteering with, you know, who have become good friends. I, I, this is a big um, shout out and like recommendation to have friends uh -huh. that are of all ages. So it, it, I think of it as a way of like sort of building a protective layer around your life. So like I have really good friends who are in their late twenties and early thirties who I did chaplaincy residency with who were like straight out of college and divinity school. And I was in like, I was like middle life mom. Um, we were in residency together. We were all students learning. And then I have these incredible friends who I was Zen hospice volunteers with who are in their seventies and eighties who are like, you know, my aunt's age, my close to my parents' age, my parents are in their mid and late eighties. Um, so I, I feel like in a way it's like, I get to learn, I get to watch and learn from my elder friends. And then I sort of get to model for my younger friends. That's sort of how I see it. And then my hope, and this was always sort of the joke we would say at Zen Hospice Project at the guest house is we sort of like would reserve our room and be like, I want to die in room six. Yeah. And, and then like, I would tell my fellow volunteers like, and I want you rubbing my feet. Yeah. Yes. Used to rub so-and-so's feet, you know? Um, so that was sort of always the, the like fantasy is like all these volunteers would come together and we would all support each other in our dying. And I have had that experience once where we have been able to encircle um, one of our, one of my colleagues who I taught, I now I'm on staff at Sun Hospice Project as an educator. Um, we teach mindful caregiving and open death conversations. And I, we were able to circle around one of our colleagues who died in this last pandemic year mm -hmm. and be with her in her dying. And wow, it was such a rich experience. So um, to me, that's part of aging gracefully is like, I have this experience, I get birthed into this life. And then I have this experience of being a human. And now I get to have this experience of dying. And everyone in the pool, let's be on this ride together. Yes. Like, to me, that is aging gracefully. Um, it's also like, inevitably we all have an aversion to dying i think it's it's built into the system of being right. human um i think aging gracefully is really accepting that inevitably we are all going to end up in the same place which is dead mm -hmm. what happens after that is a mystery right um, the people i am with who who die who have some sort of spirituality some sort of faith seem to tend to have a less hard time dying than those who don't. Mm -hmm. um, those who are in good relationships with their loved ones seem to have an easier dying than those who don't. Uh -huh. um, and, and, you know, that's not to say, you know, there's just been this real um, popular notion of the good death. Mm -hmm. And um, those of us sort of in the field are, are kind of like, mm, I mean, that really is, is subjective. It's like, what is a good death? Um, but I think gracefully aging is really developing a relationship with your mortality, acknowledging when like, oh, that's different. Oh, that's happening in my body. Oh, like I have a colleague in her fifties who like goes to bed at 9 PM every night. No, no ifs, ands, or buts, because she started to realize in chaplaincy residency, because we, there were some very sleepless nights, we did 24 hour on calls at the hospital after with a 60 hour work, 60 hour work and didactic uh, studying week. Yeah. Um, 
she's like, I need that much sleep every night because I'm at this new age and my body requires it. Mm -hmm. So having a relationship with your inner being, like inner world, like, oh, like if I don't do yoga for a week, like I get grumpy, you know, I get short. Um, So really just knowing your body, knowing your mind, you know, knowing when you start to lose your balance. Like I remember my aunt being like, I'm not going to go do that. My balance is a little bit off. And this is a woman who's been doing yoga her whole life, you know? So you just have to really be aware and have a relationship to your mind and your body and, and accept that we are in a process of dying. Mm -hmm. Every moment is dying. Every moment is passing. And, you know, I'll leave with this answer in that, you know, what I found in volunteering at the bedside and hospice is that when you actually look at dying and you sit with it, mm-hmm. and you develop a relationship with it, you are so much more in your life. I would walk out of Zen hospice after a shift, even when it was like really rough. Yeah. And our, the way we were trained was to have a sixth hour after a five hour shift and to go do something for ourselves for that sixth hour. Mm-hmm. Not talk to anybody, just focus. And I would go for walks. I would walk home or I would go take myself to a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, that was sort of my six hour routine. And I would skip out of my hospice shifts because I got to live another day. Right. I got to go out and smell the jasmine on the streets of San Francisco. You know, I got to take in that afternoon light. You know, the person I was just with didn't have that anymore or is confined to the bed. Yeah. So when you get to have, when you develop a relationship to your own mortality, that is aging gracefully. Wow. Yeah. And I'm hearing so much gratitude about that. And I just had a client appointment with someone yesterday and she's single and she was asking me about end of life documents and embarking on that whole process for herself. And, and she was asking me about my experience doing it and was it hard? And I was like, yeah, it was hard. (laughs) You know, it was hard, but like you're saying, um, once, not only is it totally necessary for your own self-care and the potential care of others to have all of that paperwork completed, notarized, whatever is required, um, you know, kind of a portfolio and a plan, um, but it feels good. It feels good to accomplish that and, and let it go. And it's kind of dipping the toe in the mortality conversation. Um, and I feel like everything you're saying and, and that you just described is very analogous to, to one's relationship with money, because it is how you do money is how you do life. And so if there's addictive behavior with, with food or work or sex or relationships, um, that it's probably going to show up with money as well. And if and there, at the end of life, yes. <laughs> and if there's an aversion to money, you know, avoidance, there's probably avoidance, um, in other areas of your life. And so nothing is simple, but it's all doable and figure outable. And with you sitting um, with with aging and, and dying people um, for your work and when you were at the bedside at, at Zen Hospice, I feel like I'm doing the same thing with people. We're with my clients, we're looking at their money and there are some quiet moments where we're just being with the feelings and the sensations and the tears or the laughter or the regret or the, the plans. And, um, so, and I, I very much share the approach and belief that, that gratitude can take you very far into your life. And I've, you know, been working with people looking at their money together and in a safe place and a safe container. And people often confess to me things they've never shared with anyone on the planet. Um, and that it's, you know, we need each other. <laughs> and so I don't know um, what else I wanted to say about that, except that um, that financial recovery and financial wellness really is spiritual work. I don't talk about that overtly with people that often, um, unless they're into it, you know, like it's a very agnostic process at the same time. But um, yes, I do believe faith and gratitude really are the keys to facing anything difficult in life. So Yeah. And I just piggyback, I love so beautiful, so well said. Um, And I just to piggyback on that, you know, 
if we get caught in this dance of aversion and like, you know, you've maybe you've heard the phrase, like whatever you resist persists, mm-hmm. if we get caught in that aversion, whether it's money or death, we miss out on these little moments, these gems of presence and understanding and connection and shift in mentality and in spirit and in relationship. And if, if we're so caught up in this sort of madness of, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want to look at this, you're going to miss out on what's going to be revealed to you. Yes. Yes. We, we got to be open-minded and honest and willing to look, willing to feel, um, and, and mine the gold. (laughs) My former coach had always said to me like, okay, Carrie, let's mine the gold. And it, in my work with people, it, it is in the numbers, like your, your money talks to you and is an expression of your values and habits and <laughs> totally fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I had a feeling before we started that we would run out of time. And I was like, I'm already, I already know I'm going to have to ask Amanda back for a, a version two or second episode another yeah. time. <laughs> so I'm trying to think, um, what would be the, the best last question for you? I guess I do want to hear, um, your thoughts on regret. So you can imagine that's a major theme in financial coaching. People, people don't come in with everything organized and bank accounts, you know, at the level where they want them to be. It's, it's a, people use the word shame and embarrassment and remorse and, and they're losing sleep. It's affecting their health. I mean, the, um, the symptoms are can can be quite intense for people. Relationship breakdowns, etc. Um, difficulty working, um, and then physical ailments as well because of their money. So, can you say anything um, from from your chaplain perspective and experience working with aging and and dying and dead people? Um, how how do you deal with regret and remorse? Um. Well, I'm talking about not having an aversion to things. I try to avoid it, really, um, in the sense that it is it is avoidable if you're in good relations with yourself and with others. Um, so, like I was saying before, you know, end of life work, and we're all in it, whether you're in it professionally or in it as a human, um, is is about the relationships and and relationship to yourself, relationship to your money relationship to, um, yeah, to your loved ones. You know, I, I, I wrote this tweet like a few days. I, I was pressing it. I didn't realize what was going to coming. I mean, I knew what was coming, but it didn't occur to me when I wrote this tweet um, on like two days before we went into shelter in place mm-hmm. in California, which was the first place to do so. It's now pinned at the top of my Twitter feed because I was looking at the date and I was like, oh my God. And I basically said, you know, I should know the tweet by now. I've seen it so many times, but it's the gist of it is, the gist of it is if you have to clear up a difficult past with somebody, or we never know when somebody is going to die. Mm -hmm. We never know when somebody's going to die. So if you have to clean up a, a difficult past with them, do it. If you have, if you want to tell them you're grateful for their love, do it. And I learned that volunteering at the bedside. I made a, a, a ritual. I love ritual around death, which is a whole other podcast I could do. Um, and I did a ritual with with people at the guest house where when I would leave because I was on staff and I would leave for the weekend, and because I wasn't working the weekend, I would say goodbye to each of the residents because I didn't know if they would be there on Monday. Right. And so I would say the same, like to, to not have regret is to be clean, be clean with your people, be clean with your money, be clean with where your money is going Yeah. to your people. Mm-hmm. Like there's, we have this whole life to have all these conversations so that, and this is what I do find a lot at the end of life, which is unfortunate. And I try to coach families on this is that really when you're in the hospital or you're at home on hospice with your loved one, you want your energy to be expended on connection, on healing, on saying those things you've always needed to say. Yeah. You don't wanna be spending your time 
on paperwork. Yeah. Money, the paperwork, mm-hmm. the advanced care, the what decision would mom want? Mm-hmm. It's not fair to the process. It's not fair to the patient. It's not fair to you because you miss out. Like I said, you're going to miss out on all those gems. And there are a lot of gems at the end of life. I, I'm here to tell you, it can be a beautiful thing. It can be an extremely painful thing. But even in that pain, there can be a lot of beauty. Um, so I just think in order to avoid regret, yeah, get cross those T's, dot those I's, get, right. get that advanced care directive, mm-hmm. notarized, um, sort out, have those money conversations with your loved ones ahead of time. Yes. I think, I think I've always felt that when I became a parent, I say two things about parenthood. I say many things about parenthood, but two things I say about parenthood is I think when I became a parent, I became a parent to all children. I think that's why I'm working in pediatrics so much these days and, and in families. I became a parent to all children. Yeah. All children are important to me now, more so than ever before. Than mm-hmm. before being a parent. And then the other thing I, I, I say is, um, is that... I forgot it. Oh my God. That's such a middle-aged thing. Oh my God. Don't worry. (laughs) Is um, I became a parent. I got caught in the parenthood thing. I became a parent to all children. Um, And yeah, I guess maybe it's just along those lines of it's my job. Oh, this is it. (laughs) It's my job as a parent to teach my kid how to do money, how to die, how to be kind, how to be resilient, how to face fear, how to be mindful, how to eat, how to sleep, right. you know, the essentials. And so learning how to be with money is just as important as learning how to die. Wow. They're, they're very similar. <laughs> yes, they are. To be continued. Yeah. I'm glad I remembered that. That would have been an awful way to end. <laughs> I would have gone on and I would have let it go. It would have been fine. Oh, you're just the best. Um, Amanda has generously shared with us her death awareness resources, which is a long document that I will share with my clients and um, financial literacy membership site members and anyone else that wants to request that you can send me an email. Um, Amanda, if our listeners want to learn more about you and what you do, how can they find you? Um, you know, I tweet a lot. I love Twitter. Um, I've connected with a lot of end of life palliative care folks on there. Um, so gift of grief is my Twitter handle. Okay. Um, I also have a blog gift of grief. It's, it's, it's quite outdated, but it really kind of, it's the writing I had begun to do when I became a hospice volunteer and it's, it's, it's all in there. Um, it, it, it's a great, um, ride through what being with, uh, death is like when you're new to it. Um, and then, you know, I'm moving into this, I'm moving into a new space and work, which I'm curious about around the use of psychedelics in end of life and PTSD and, and working with people um, to get through their trauma um, using psychedelics. So that's an exciting new venture that's happening in end of life care that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of threading towards. Amazing. Okay. Oh, I can't wait to hear more. And thank you so much for your time. This was really fun. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) And with that, we're out of time. Thank you again for tuning in and please acknowledge yourself for taking the time today to learn, practice, connect, and receive support. I am Carrie Friedberg, the SF Money Coach. You can contact me and find information about my coaching practice, Personal Finance 101 online course and financial literacy membership site at SF, as in San Francisco, moneycoach.com. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments. I would love to hear from you. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. And with that, we're out of time. Thank you again for tuning in and please acknowledge yourself for taking the time to learn, practice, connect, and receive support around money. I am Carrie Friedberg, the SF Money Coach. You can contact me and find information about my coaching practice, online course, and financial literacy membership site at SF, as in San Francisco, sfmoneycoach.com. Please reach out if you have any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you. We'll talk soon.